How are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. We're finally doing it. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for thanks for uh, willing to. My pleasure. Sorry, it was so difficult. I just finished directing a Netflix series. Okay. And um, it's really good. I can't wait to share it. It's it's a good one. It's you know sometimes you get them in there. It's it's I like this one a lot. And then I've been busy doing voice work and so much other stuff. So it's been hard to find the time. Tell me about you, because you obviously know something about me. I know nothing about you. Tell me about you. Uh, well, I started doing interviews last summer after I did Billy Steinberg. It started with Billy Steinberg. He was the songwriter of um, Like a Virgin and So Emotional and uh, other really big 80s and 90s songs. And then I started to just try to um, see if I could focus more on a lot of the anime dub voice actors that I grew up with and uh, impact me so much. And this, it started with Wendy Lee and then it just uh, went from there. <laughs> <clears throat> so which shows have you followed? Well, my single favorite series, if I can pick one, is probably Kenshin. I did Kenshin. Yeah. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. It was Lady M. Yeah. And um, which which one of the dubs did you direct? Uh, Samurai X. Okay. Yeah, because I was that's one of the things I was gonna ask you about, but I was gonna go in order first and start from the beginning and ask uh, what led up to Marcus Welby MD. Oh, well. I started acting when I was 12 years old. Okay. And I did a lot of plays and I was in a lot of theater uh, productions of, oh gosh. <clears throat> I did a play with Vincent Price. Oh, wow. Uh, I did Peter Pan with him. I was, was I 13 or 14? <clears throat> and it was at the Valley Music Theater and I played one of the forest animals, and he was Captain Hook. Wow. He was the best Hook I've ever seen. <laughs> he was naughty. He was slightly naughty. He was really funny. One time we were going on stage. No, he, he had lived all the time. Janet Blair played Peter Pan, and... When it came time to walk Hook off the plank, you know, yeah. she said, instead of saying, Hook, this is your last, <clears throat> she said, Hook, you have uttered your last ad lib. He, he was great. Anyhow, Marcus Welby. I had done a, a play and the head of casting came to see me in it. And right away, I got a two-part series uh, in I mean, a two-part episode of Marcus Welby. And that's how that happened. And I played a singing nun. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> what was your uh, experience working with, uh, like, Robert Young and James Brolin? <clears throat> I didn't know who James Brolin was. This is kind of an embarrassing but funny situation. He was wearing a blue leisure suit. And he looked so strange. I mean, he looked so frumpy. I thought, who's that? And what's he doing on the set? <clears throat> Robert Young couldn't have been nicer. And he wrote me a lovely letter afterwards, thanking me for my, uh, my participation in the show and told me he really liked my work. And <clears throat> he was lovely. I, I worked with, uh, Robert Young, my scene was, my scenes weren't with uh, James Brolin. Okay. Um, wondering who, what your experience was on the film uh, Duchess and the Water Fox. I absolutely had a mad crush on George Siegel. We rehearsed for two weeks here at, on 20th Century Lot. And um, <clears throat> he was flirty. He was jokey. 
much older than me. I mean, I was a kid, but I, I just thought he was adorable. And then we filmed it in Denver. And um, <clears throat> I loved it. I loved it. It was, it was a memorable experience. I have a picture around somewhere. Maybe it's on my website. I adored him so much. It was so funny. And, and I had not, I was rusty on my ballet. I'd always danced my whole life, but <clears throat> The choreographer was very, very strict. And he said, have you done ballet? And I said, well, yes, in the past. That's not good enough. And actually, I'll tell you how I got the part. That's a really interesting story. Mm -hmm. I was dancing at one of my best friend's wedding. And the producer of the show watched me. And from watching me, he was inspired to write my part into the movie. Wow. It was lovely. It was just a lovely, lovely experience. And, and poor Goldie, I didn't see much of Goldie on set except when she was working. And when she was working, she was fabulous, but she wasn't very chatty because she was very sick with pneumonia. I kept in touch with George after that. And he used to have these, uh, these things out in Beverly Hills at, um, I forget what it was called, but he played the banjo with his band and oh. I'd go see him and say hi. Yeah, that's cool. And which, uh, which season and like which cast of Charlie's Angels were you a part of? <laughs> that's like saying, do you remember your lines? <laughs> I, I worked George Sanford Brown who, was married to Tyne Daly, cast me in the project. I'll, I'll have to look it up and see what episode it was and see if I can track it down. Okay. But, you know, through, through the life, you have so many shows you've seen and been in, and I forget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I forget which episode and what and where. But I'm, I'm always grateful that I have the work and have had the work I've had. Right. Was being on Chips more memorable then? Chips was another thing. The director cast me and um, and I had a good role. Um, I remember, and this is another episode I've never seen. <laughs> okay. um, I played a mother whose kid was sick because he was hit by a bicycle. And it was a real emotional role. I love, I love when, you know, you're fortunate enough to get emotional roles. That's where I thrive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what about with uh, the man who loved women? That's another interesting story, how I got that picture. The head of casting I knew was a friend of mine and I was pregnant with my son at the time. And I got cast as Burt Reynolds' pregnant fantasy. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that you had to, you got to be part of a TV movie with uh, Sharon Stone before she was famous. Yeah, yeah. Sharon, Sharon and I hung out. <clears throat> we had tea together. We talked herbal stuff. She was a vegetarian, I was a vegetarian. So we talked about that in between takes and um, she was lovely to work with. Another show I have never seen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I must confess that, uh, you know, some people go and they, they track their stuff down. They go, I've got to see it, I've got to see it. I'm, I'm not one of those. It's like, okay, I did it, I experienced now you know, on to the next. It was fabulous to work with. <clears throat> Just very down to earth, very grounded. Mm -hmm. And actually, I remember I was, uh, it was kind of a rebellious period of my life. And I had my first audition. I went to see them and I went back and they wanted me to come back. And I said, eh. I'm roller skating. So I went to 20th Century Fox, which was where the show uh, was out of. <clears throat> and I was still on my roller skates. 
I walked oh. into the call back on roller skates. <laughs> <laughs> Any funny story with being in Fatal Charm too? Fatal Charm, I I know the director. He's an old and no, I know the producer. <clears throat> He's an old friend of mine. His mother was uh, the godmother to my son. Oh. And um, I had an audition for it because he wasn't the director. So I had an audition for the director, Abel Farrar, who ended up being, do you know who he is? Yeah. <clears throat> um, he ended up being like doing, he was known for all of his horror movies. Yeah. And uh, I played a running coach, another mm. movie I've never seen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know, I know right around the same time as the Sharon Stone movie, you were on Silver Spoons. <clears throat> oh, I loved working on Silver Spoons and they really loved me. And they said, we're going to make you a regular and we're going to have you back. Ricky Schroeder was just cute. He was a cute little kid. And <clears throat> I got on with everybody on that set. I loved working that show. The director um, passed away not too long after that, oh. but um, <clears throat> he was wonderful to work with. And he said, I love your work. I'm going to have you back. And um, you know, the rest is history. This was going back a little bit, but an interesting movie, uh, Warhead. Now, there are a million stories to that. <laughs> um, that was with David Jansen. I was very, very young. And I got cast in the show, in, in the movie. My friend, Art Matrano, who just passed away. I don't oh. know whether you know his name. But <clears throat> he was one of the stars. He played... Captain Munchen, Munchen, something like that in uh, uh, Police Academy. Oh, yeah. He's the guy who comes out of the shower and he's got glue in his hair and he's yeah. trying to get... It. <clears throat> Anyhow, Art said, I want to be in that. You're going to Israel? I said, yeah. He goes, who's casting it? I told him. And next thing I know, Art and I were going to Israel together. David Jansen starred in that. He was the fugitive. And David used to say to me, because I used to go collect seashells on the shore. She sells seashells on the seashore. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was just so pretty. And I used to collect shells. And I was younger than all the people on the set. And so David would say to me, hey, Stern. You've got to learn to rub shoulders with the mucky muck. Come on, have dinner with us. And, <clears throat> and I went and they were drinking. I didn't drink. I was, I was a kid. So I felt kind of awkward and embarrassed. And so everybody kept getting killed in the movie. It was a war movie. And then finally, Buddy came to me and said, Ellen, I know I finally decided how we're going to kill you. We're going to have you hanging naked on a cross in Israel. And I said, that's not in the script. He goes, it is now. I said, I don't want to do that. Well, a few days later, I was dead in the script. Oh. But I was one of the last to be killed. So I, I lasted a long time in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but we filmed in... Uh, on Valley of the Moon, which was the desert. And that's where all the nomads uh, were living. Actually, while we were filming uh, Warhead, <clears throat> they were filming Billy Two Hats with Gregory Peck. Oh, and wow. um, then they were filming also Jesus Christ Superstar. <clears throat> and Desi Arnaz Jr. filming Billy Two Hats. So all the sets would gather together and we'd have parties wow. on the beach at night. <clears throat> and uh, actually Desi Arnaz was dating Liza Minnelli at that time. And she was all over him and he was all over her. They, they were 
they were so in love at that time. Anyhow, there's lots of stories. I'd need an hour to tell stories about that and what happened. And <clears throat> you can read about it in the newspapers. Another movie I did, it's, it's Western with an old Western actor called Rod Cameron. It was Jesse's Girls. And we filmed for several weeks on Paramount Ranch. After that, we went to Utah. And I remember we were all dressed for summer and I was wearing this short sleeve and it was snowing and they had to use a lens so that we wouldn't see the snow. And I was standing there shivering and in between takes, they'd throw blankets on us. <clears throat> oh, here's another funny story about that. So they said to me, do you know how to ride horseback? Well, I'd been riding horses since I was a kid. My neighbor had a horse and we'd go out to the stables and ride. And <clears throat> so I said, yeah, I know how to ride. And anyhow, when we're in Utah, they presented me with a horse that was wider than this screen. And his name was Rowdy. And, and I said, I'm supposed to ride that? And they said, yeah. And the horse went, Neh! you know, one of those old Gene Autry stands with the horse, with the hooves, yeah. all the way up in the air. I said, you want me to ride that? They said, well, you said you could ride. I said, well, I said I could ride. I didn't mean I could ride. <laughs> well, in addition to riding Rowdy, where I was, um, my thighs were almost like this because he was so wide. I had to ride him bareback. So they taught me how to ride bareback on the ranch. And, and um, it was, it was really, it was really fun. It was exciting. It was scary, but it was fun. And you hold on to the horse's mane and you've got reins in your hand and it's all about the thighs. You've got to hug the horse's haunches with your thighs. And that's the way you stay on. It's all to do with hip and, and uh, thigh, uh, thigh movement. <clears throat> So anyhow, I rode bareback. I played uh, an Indian, which I had a little problem with because I thought I am not an Indian, but mm -hmm. I've always had, you know, a complexion that if you put a wig on me, you know, I could go either way. Okay. So they put a long black wig on me, straight hair. I mean, it would never happen today because right. You know, it's politically incorrect. As a matter of fact, I had a fight scene in uh, a corral with another girl, girl on girl fighting. <laughs> uh, you can see, if you look, she hits me and I go, oh, and you see the wig come up from my head a little bit. Boing. <laughs> Actually, it was on that movie that uh, the casting director came up to me and he said, I'd like you to audition for this movie. And I had a boyfriend and I said, do you mind if my boyfriend auditions also? Do you have any male roles? He said, yeah. Well, we both got the leads and that was Richard Epcar, my right. husband. And that's how we started dubbing. That was our first film. <clears throat> it was live action. But from then on, it was just, we, we just kept doing one project after another. It never stopped. You guys were uh, part of the whole group of people that were in Macross and Robotech? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you talk about stories. Um, I did a TV show that was directed by this guy, Joe Cranston, whose son, Brian Cranston. Oh. <laughs> so anyhow, it was a show for KCET and Brian and I were both in it. And uh, God, that was years ago. It was before I was even dating Richard. Wow. So Brian and I go back years and years and years as a matter of fact, I, I see him once in a while. 
I've I've gone to New York and seen I saw him in his play net, uh, network and I saw him in his the LBJ play all all the way and then you know talked to him afterwards and so we see him once in a while. Yeah, Eddie wanted me to say hi to both of you guys yesterday. Oh, I adore Eddie. <laughs> Eddie's dear, we we go back to, you know, like Robotech and Macross and all those things. Actually, we were dubbing even before Robotech. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, it started with that one show, but, um, oh gosh, the stories. We we had our, our first, our first son was born Actually, I'll tell you a funny story filming wise. I was doing uh, General Hospital. I was on the show for like a year, year and a half, something like that. In those days, you could never say you were pregnant. So I never told them. Oh. But the wardrobe must have known and nobody said a word to me. Nobody said, oh, Ellen, how, how are you feeling? How's, how's the pregnancy coming? Because in those days, nobody was allowed to be pregnant if you were an actress. Yeah. And they thought if you were pregnant or you had a baby, that was the end of your career. So as a matter of fact, I remember I went for an audition once and I was eight months pregnant, which is pretty big. And I was wearing a dress and the casting director leaned forward and he said, my dear, you should really lose some weight. And I would rather have him thought of me as fat than being pregnant. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, what, a, what a way we've come for women in this business. Anyhow, we had our son and he was walking. He was like a year old. We didn't have a babysitter. And Richard and I were at the studio and our son was running up and down the stairs. He was in one studio. I was in another studio and we trusted everybody in there. And so everybody took care of him. As a matter of fact, Brian Cranston at one point was taking care of him. Everybody took care of him. I was being directed by this guy, Bob Barron, who yeah. is his, you know who he is. Yeah. Anyhow, Bob smoked, chain smoked non-stop ate candy bars and drank coffee i think he lived on that i think his blood was made of sugar and caffeine and so you'd work in the studio in this you couldn't breathe because the smoke was so thick you could see the the smoke clouds in the air it was just so smoky so um in those days we had reels and they'd They'd have the project running on a reel and uh, then the end of the reel would happen and they'd go reel change and I'd go, <gasps> and I'd run out the door because that was my chance to breathe. Oh. <laughs> and I remember, oh, talking about people, Carl Masak. <clears throat> Carl came into the booth, I remember one day and he said, how's everything going? Everything good? And I said, yeah, Carl, everything's great. And, um, you know, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> but Carl, Carl was a lovely, lovely guy. And he, he made, he brought anime to this, to the States in a way it hadn't been before. There was anime here, but it didn't really get started till we did Robotech. Yeah. And. If you ask me what roles I did in those days, we didn't write down the roles unless you were the main character. Okay. So I did tons of roles in Robotech and I don't remember what they were. Okay. <laughs> did you guys know Lisa Michelson? Oh yes, yes, of course, of course. Yes, so tragic. Yeah. It was at her funeral. Yes. As a matter of fact, the night before the funeral, Greg and his brother stayed up all night and built the casket for her. They built oh, wow. the wooden casket just 
Very, very tragic. Yeah. So sad. And it's and now it's kind of moving ahead a little bit, but uh do you remember when you first met Bridget Hoffman? Bridget, lovely Bridget. Yeah, we worked together for years. Haven't seen Bridget in a while, but she's she's lovely. Mm -hmm. And her husband. They're lovely, lovely people. She Bridget, as a as a matter of fact, had uh, I used to just stare at her. She Bridget has such an ethereal beauty about her face. Mm -hmm. She's just she's ethereal looking. So how did you become involved with directing the first dub of Kenshin? Yeah. Uh, it was me, Richard, and Mike Sorich. Okay. And I'll tell you a funny story. Sorich loves, loves this story. He laughs. I walked in. It was a very hot day. The air conditioning was broken in the booth. And <clears throat> Mike Sorich was directing. And I looked in. He was down to his tidy whities no. I, I don't remember what color they were. I'm, I'm, I haven't got that fanatical of a memory <laughs> about it, but I was totally shocked that there he was directing in his underwear. So I went into the head of the studio and I said, Mike is not wearing any clothes. She goes, oh no, that's Mike Sorich. He's a character and a half. I actually have a it's an animation cell of Kenshin from the second opening theme song. Wow, that is cool. That's very cool. Yeah, it's my uh, my my uh, my main hobby is collecting cells for anime. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's that's a good hobby. <laughs> I really enjoyed directing Samurai X. Um, it was it was a good story, and I loved the characters. <clears throat> the characters were all really good. One of the first video games you directed to was uh, Galarian's. Actually, before that was one called Jade Cocoon. Oh, that's right. And Jade yeah. Cocoon is it's still the story still haunts me. It it was just a beautiful 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 story and um if you've never played it the original jade cocoon is so beautiful it's about what women do for men and after every woman would give to a man she'd lose a skin and every time women would give they'd lose a skin until when all their skins were gone they die and I, I find it analogous to what women do and, you know, how we are the, the caretakers and the givers. Mm -hmm. All right. And I know around that same time in the late 90s, uh, would you, you, would you would have been around uh, Bryce Pappenbrook when he was just a kid? Bryce Pappenbrook, of course, I knew Bryce when he was a baby. Um, <laughs> his father, Bob, yeah. was our very, one of our best friends. As a matter of fact, uh, funny story about Bob and Bryce. Bob invited us out to a cabin. What I didn't know was that the cabin was Debbie's, his wife's. But he said, come out to my cabin. And Pappenbrook had this voice like, Come on, it's Pappenbrook. He had a voice like that. Yeah. And not Bryce. Bryce did not inherit that. So we go out to his cabin and we couldn't find it. And we thought, are we in the right place? And it's pitch black. And all we hear is crickets and critters. And there's a lake out there. And finally, all of a sudden, this car zooms up. And it's Pappenbrook. And he goes, you ready? And we go, for what? He goes, we're going in the boat. So we went in the boat. It was a motorboat, a speedboat. And there we are going down this narrow strait of a lake. And he's speeding down. It was Bryce. Bryce was a little boy. It was our two kids, Richard and me. I thought we were going to die that night. 
oh god so many stories about him and and bryce is just a sweetie mm -hmm. he's just a sweetie he's as sweet as they come he's lovely i think he's got two kids now yeah we were at his wedding what about with uh, armitage armitage i only know this because and i have seen this one i played rosalind yeah and um, <clears throat> she was the librarian. I was just about to say that I know you had a, a bigger role in some of the Gundam series. Well, I played the lead villains. Yep. I played Martha Viss Carbine. <clears throat> and she, I really liked her. She was, she was right here. She was like dry, dry, dead, rolled leaves. And I like playing villains. They're fun. They're more nuanced and very colorful. <clears throat> I I, re I did, I played Martha Viss Carbon, I think, for five or six years. Yep. All right. In all the Gundams. You, I know you had a big part in one of my favorite video games, actually, Shadow Hearts. <clears throat> oh, Yeah. I was Veronica Vera. Yep. She was she was a siren. Yep. <laughs> she was fun. You also got to be like the casting director for the game too. Oh yeah, that's right. I was. <laughs> I mean, if we if we did the uh, if if we were directing it, then we also cast it. <clears throat> okay. That's generally the way it was. But early on, it was the Japanese, and now it's still, for the most part, the Japanese clients who select who they want. Mm -hmm. And you submit auditions, and they select. It's back when I talked to um, back when I talked to Kari Walgren, uh, that was the first person to ever bring up her role in Shadow Hearts, too. So, mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> that's I think that's when I met Carrie Kari yeah I think that's when we first met and I that was one of Stephanie Shea's first roles too <laughs> that's right that's right I didn't know that I'd totally forgotten that Stephanie and I are really good friends also and we we either are directing each other or either I'm directing her or she's directing me mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of that together and Michael sent to Nicholas also I know of course that you guys are really really close with Michelle mm -hmm. Ruff yes we're very good friends with Michelle as a matter of fact <clears throat> Richard Michelle and I and uh, Tony Oliver and uh, let's see who else. Anyhow, we're all going uh, to New York for New York Comic Con. Right. And um, <clears throat> so we're, we're going to be hanging out there. Mm -hmm. Her and her husband and Richard and I are good friends. So how did it, how do you, or how did you come to be involved of playing Masaki in Bleach? <laughs> I didn't even audition for that. Oh. I was cast. She was, I, I do remember her voice. She was ethereal. And it, it's, uh, what was his name? Ichigo. The character. Ichigo, I love you. Where are you? Ichigo. Mm -hmm. Ichigo, where are you? I love playing her because she was such a true heart. Mm -hmm. She was such a true mother's heart. Oh, there is one um, that I did a whole bunch of episodes in this one. I was one of the leads in it. They call it Noeen or Noen. Oh, right. Yeah. And I played Yu's mom. And one of my favorite lines in that whole series, because his name was Yu by Yu. And I'd go, I swear this was my line. You, where are you? And you got to play uh, another another big mom character in Skip Beat. 
what was her name? Mrs. Tashio or something. And that, that was, that was great fun. And I think that was Christina V who directed that. Okay. And, and it was Mela Lee's project. Right. And, you know, they're great. They're both really good voice actors. Uh, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, I directed both of them in, uh, Pokemon Adventure, Pokemon Generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to... You've done your homework. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask about uh, your experience with, with directing Pokemon next. Well, here's, here's the very sad truth. Um, <clears throat> of course, I knew Pokemon, but I knew nothing about the history of what it was or anything. So I got thrown in cold. Okay. Then um, <clears throat> I had to hurry up and learn all the uh, all the characters. So I jumped in with both feet. <laughs> but it's I I love doing it. It was a lot of fun. And then I played played Agatha. I had to audition for it. I didn't get it. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> Just as I was auditioning. Yeah. And her thing, I'm going to stand back. She, she'd go, go, Jenga! She was loud. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I suppose since you've been in um, like a, a, a variety of the Lupin series, that there's more of a story with that. I've been in almost every single one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I played this really, really crazy old lady who um, I, I can't I can't tell the story because otherwise, if you see it, you'll it gives it away. But <clears throat> well, I'll just tell part of it. She's an alien. Richard always remembers. You know, we go to these conventions, and I'll say, "What was the name of the character that I did?" And he'll tell me. <laughs> he's got he's got a, a really retentive memory. Um, <clears throat> But she sang being drunk, and it's really, really funny. The way that I, the final question I usually do for interviews is asking, what do you want your legacy to be? Well, I'm not ready to say what my legacy is because I'm still doing so much. Uh, I mean, recently I've been directing for Netflix, as I told you. Yeah. <clears throat> and, oh, the there's a great series coming out in Christmas. And <clears throat> but I, I'm also, I also wrote and starred in with Richard and Stephen Tobolowsky, if you oh. know who he is. Yeah. <clears throat> Stephen's in it. It's called Life's a Bitch. Okay. And we've got a couple of teasers, and Richard and I are always doing vignettes and posting them. And hopefully uh, very soon we will be able to say that we will have shot the pilot. <clears throat> okay. So that, it's it's a funny, funny show. I'm hoping that gets off the ground. My legacy is, I hope people will look at me and say that that I've been kind that I've been a good person, that I haven't harmed, that they've respected my body of work, that they've respected me as an actress, that they respect my family, that, the, that my lineage lives on beyond me, and is reflective of all those values. And incidentally, I have to put in a pitch for my son, <clears throat> our son. He is going, he's the drummer on Seth Meyers this coming week. Not this coming week, uh, November 22nd through the 25th. Okay. We're going to be there in New York to see him. The life is a journey mm -hmm. and and each day you choose the direction you want to go in and choose happiness and choose goodness 
and choose kindness and harm to none. And then I think we'll have done a good job. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for uh, willing to do this. I'm glad that we finally got to. I'm so glad we finally got to meet Chris, and I'm so sorry it took so long. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> but it, you've, you're a good interviewer, and um, you've asked really interesting questions. I wish you all the luck with this. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Chris, have a lovely day. This was Yay. lovely talking to you. Thank you. You too. <laughs> Bye. Bye.